thank you all for coming. Um, today's topic is leveraging hydronics and radiant heating and cooling to help achieve decarbonization goals. My name is Haley Mick. For those of you who do not know me, I'm a chemical engineer by degree from Auburn University, and I have about 17 years of uh, experience in commercial construction with a handful of companies, and I'm a member of ASHRAE, ASPE, ASHI, and the Upanor Sustainability Core Team. So we, here's a look at our agenda um, for the day. We're really going to cover a lot of information in this hour. Um, so I'm going to try to get through it as quickly as possible. I have a little bit of a sore throat, so if you cannot hear me, just let me know, and I'll try to get closer to the microphone. Um, and then hopefully we'll have time for Q&A at the end. If uh, not within the hour, you're welcome to stay, and we can have some questions after the fact. So before we get started, I think it's really important just to remind everyone why we care to begin with. And the reality that we're currently facing is that between now and 2050, the population is expected to increase by 1.9 billion people. At which point, 7 billion people are expected to live in urban areas. And to support this growth, it's estimated that some version of New York City is being built somewhere around the world every 34 days for the next 37 years. And the built environment generates an estimated 40% of annual global CO2 emissions. And decarbonizing our built environment is really a critical step to achieving our climate goals. The Sustainable Development Goals, or SDGs, emerged from rigorous research into global conditions and trends and really provide a blueprint to achieve a better, more sustainable future for all. And the 17 goals are all interconnected. And in order to leave no one behind, it's really critical that we achieve all of these goals by 2030. So let's get started with our actual presentation by discussing some system definitions and differences. I think it's probably safe to assume that everyone here is in some way, shape, or form involved in constructing buildings. We build buildings to protect us from the elements, to protect us from extreme temperature, to keep us safe, to keep us comfortable. Um, and in HVAC, our job is relatively simple. We need to balance the heat gains and losses through the building, along with internal heat gains, to maintain consistent, comfortable indoor spaces. This could be as simple as a fire pit in a primitive structure. But for the commercial systems that we're talking about today, we use engineered solutions, from unitary rooftop equipment to complete hydronic systems with cooling towers, boilers, chillers, and pumps. These systems essentially heat and cool interior spaces primarily by conditioning the temperature of the discharge air from the air handling unit. This, of course, is convective heat transfer, more specifically, forced convection. But there are other ways to transfer heat. We know that there are three forms of heat transfer, convection, conduction, and radiation. Convection, as we just discussed, is heat transfer through the movement of molecules, specifically air. Conduction is heat transfer through contact between two bodies at a different temperature. And radiation is heat transfer through electromagnetic waves. Now let's apply that to the types of systems that we use. The first thing that we want to discuss is an air-based system and what we mean by central versus decentralized design. What we're really talking about here is where in the building is the heat transfer happening between the air and the coil with either the water or refrigerant uh, medium. Is that happening in a central plant and then being distributed through ductwork, or is that happening locally in your individual zones? So this is an air side system or a forced air system versus a distributed or decentralized system. And regardless of which option has been chosen, the goal is to heat the air, cool the air, and address the humidity in the air um, by means of having it come in contact with a coil, hydronic or DX coil. Um, whether you have a central or decentralized plant, we still have to address ventilation. Ventilation is about providing fresh air to deal with toxins that might be building up in the space. So if you have a decentralized system, you're still probably going to have some ductwork and a dedicated outdoor air system. But central forced air systems um, often attempt to handle both comfort and ventilation simultaneously. 
Whereas decentralized systems use separate dedicated uh, systems to address comfort and ventilation. ASHRAE even addresses these two with two different standards. We have standard 55 for comfort and we have standard 62.1 for ventilation. Because there are so many variables that need to be addressed for thermal comfort and so many other variables that need to be addressed for ventilation, building these large central station air handlers is often quite cumbersome, difficult to properly select, and gets expensive rather quickly. Furthermore, it sets up um, an operation that is quite complex and requires us to use more energy than is necessary. Temperature, humidity, contaminants, and oxygen levels do not fluctuate in proportion to one another. And thermostats and sensors need to monitor all of these details and react accordingly. If the temperature is sufficient in the space, for example, but the CO2 levels are high, the central station air handler is going to have to turn on, bring in outdoor air, condition it, and this is ultimately going to have an impact on your space temperature. Conversely, when we have separate systems, the heating and cooling equipment can now focus solely on comfort. It can do what it does and do so well. And the dedicated outdoor air system can do what it does and do so well without taxing either system. Also, with a central system, when you have a failure, the whole building is down versus a decentralized system where you may have a failure in one zone and you're down just there locally. Lastly, it takes significantly more energy to move air than it does to move water. So for the purpose of this presentation and the evaluation that we're going to do, we're going to make the assumption that ventilation is ha handled separately um, regardless of the heat transfer medium that you select. So now we're going to move on to that. Water versus refrigerant. Again, we have several options in HVAC systems. Um, in commercial construction today, and frankly, there's not really a set of rules for when to use which. It's often a function of space, location, purpose, budget, timeline, engineer preference, owner preference, maybe the goals of the project. But the concept behind the design options here are pretty similar in that they both distribute fluid to um, the local zones and condition the air there. But the amount of refrigerant that's used in a hydronic system is negligible and typically contained versus a VRF system which contains refrigerant which sends refrigerant filled piping throughout the entire building. And it's hard to dispute the fact that minimizing the volume of refrigerant in our buildings is going to minimize our greenhouse gas emissions. Global warming potential or GWP is a measure of how destructive a climate pollutant is. The GWP of a gas refers to the total contribution to global warming resulting from the emission of one unit of that gas relative to the reference gas, which is carbon dioxide and has been assigned a value of one. Refrigerants today are often thousand times, thousands times more polluting than carbon dioxide. The two most common refrigerants currently being used are R134A and R410A, which have a GWP of 1430 and 2088, respectively. Meanwhile, water has a GWP of zero. Granted, there is a lot of research well underway for refrigerants that use much lower, that have much lower GWPs. But think back to 2006, if you were in the industry then, and we were all using R22, and we developed 410A and 134A because we thought it was better, right? We're going to continue to develop new refrigerants, but we need to minimize our use of refrigerants. Don't get me wrong, I'm not anti-refrigeration. Uh, we need that. It's important for what we're dealing with, but we don't need to overuse the technology. At the very least, it's important to note that when the decision is made to use a refrigerant-based system like a VRF system, um, there are several additional safety measures that need to be put in place to protect both the occupants and the environment per ASHRAE standards 15, 34, and 147. So let's discuss VRF just a little bit further to make sure everyone understands what we're talking about. VRF, or variable refrigerant flow, sometimes called variable refrigerant volume, is a system that uses refrigerant as the working fluid to distribute the heat in the building. First developed 
um, in the 1980s in Japan and um, made its way to the North American market in early 2000s. The system output is regulated based on system load. <clears throat> Excuse me, based on system load. And the refrigerant flow is regulated by electronic expansion valves and variable speed compressors. In general, VRF consists of a cent one central outdoor air unit, um, one central outdoor unit, can be water cooled or air cooled, and multiple uh, cassettes of different types and capacities distributed throughout the space. And here we see a general representation of a hydronic distribution system, which is sort of similar to the VRF design, only it uses water rather than refrigerant as the heat transfer medium. So this design would have a water-cooled or air-cooled chiller, maybe a boiler, heat pump, some combination of those pieces of equipment to create hot or chilled water to send to the terminal units. Now, radiant heating and cooling is a bit different than what we've seen. Um, but it's been around for centuries around the world. So you look at the Roman hypocaust, for example, where they would circulate hot flue gases under the raised floor slabs. This hot gas would increase the floor temperature and create warm, comforting environment, taking advantage of the thermal mass of the floor to hold on to the heat. And then we have the Korean on doll system, a system where they also use those hot flue gases from the stove, or the oven, and they circulate it through the underside of the floor before exhausting it through the chimney. <clears throat> and that's really how radiant systems work. We think about the conventional design process. The architect designs the building envelope, the walls, the ceiling, and then the engineer calculates the heat gains and losses both internally and externally based on the architectural design and then designs an appropriately sized HVAC system to offset those gains and losses. Well, radiant systems are really a beautiful integration of architecture and sustainable HVAC design, where we're actually using the architectural elements to maintain comfortable spaces. And we see this approach in small residential projects all the way up to large commercial projects like the Bangkok Airport in Thailand. And here we see the Academy of Sciences building in San Francisco, California. Now, with contemporary radiant heating and cooling systems, we don't circulate hot flue gases under the floor anymore. We use water. We circulate chilled water or heating hot water depending on the mode of operation through a network of PEX tubing that's embedded in the concrete slab. And by simply controlling the flow and temperature of the water that we're circulating, we're able to control the temperature of the slab and therefore drive heat transfer in one direction or the other. When we circulate heating hot water, we are using the slab to radiate heat. When we circulate chilled water, we're using the slab to absorb heat. So the PEX tubing is routed in the concrete slab and it comes up to the manifolds, which we see on the right hand side here. Um, and that's where we make our chilled water and hot water connections. And one question we sometimes get is, when you're heating, it makes sense to heat from the floor. But when you're cooling, um, don't you need to cool from the ceiling because hot air rises? Actually, hot air does not rise per se. So if it doesn't rise, where does it go? And to answer this question, we simply go back to our good friend, the second law of thermodynamics, or more specifically, the second formulation of the second law, known as the Clausius Statement, which states that heat will naturally go unless work is being done to it from a high state to a low state. For us, that means from hot to cold. And intuitively, we understand this. It makes sense. We grab a hot cup of coffee. The heat is transferred from the cup to your hand. If you grab a cold glass, the heat is actually transferred from your hand to the glass, leaving you with the sensation of feeling cold. So it doesn't really matter if the surface that we're cooling is the floor or the wall or the ceiling, as long as there's a temperature difference or delta T between the controlled surface and the object or the people within the space, we're always going to get heat transfer. And we're able to use this to create very comfortable spaces. If you look at the way the human body exchanges heat energy with the space around it, you see that almost half of it is through radiation. So it makes sense that systems that rely on radiation, heat transfer, are more conducive to human thermal comfort. You can almost think of your skin as a radiant surface where you're constantly exchanging energy with the space around you. 
And the rate at which this energy either leaves or enters your body is based on the delta T between the space temperature and your skin surface temperature, leaving you with a sensation of either feeling hot or cold. So now that we've talked about systems, let's discuss a few definitions. For starters, what are we actually referring to when we say net zero? Is it energy? Is it electricity? Is it carbon? Is it emissions? Is one more important than the other? The answer is yes. We cannot get to one without the other. Our goal is to get to net zero carbon, but we must minimize the energy that we're using and change to clean energy sources in order to achieve that goal. Decarbonization refers to the goal of ending our dependence on oil and gas as power sources to reduce carbon dioxide emissions that raise global temperatures. Electrification refers to using technology such as heat pumps or vehicles that use electricity instead of burning fossil fuels such as oil, gas, and coal. Electricity generated through clean resources such as wind and solar power is considered a decarbonization strategy. In order to reach net zero, emissions from our commercial buildings will need to be reduced and balanced. And there are many schemes that help offset carbon through planting trees or using technology like carbon capture and storage, but we have to start the process with intentional designs that use clean energy sources, maximize energy efficiency, minimize transportation cost, and conserve our most precious resource, which is water. From the ASHRAE position document on building decarbonization, we can read that ASHRAE's position is that decarbonization of buildings and their systems must be based on a holistic analysis, including healthy, safe, and comfortable environments, energy efficiency, environmental impact, sustainability, operational security, and economics. What it boils down to is this. We need a comprehensive approach that addresses every stage of a building's life cycle, design, construction, operation, and decommissioning. The main contributors to greenhouse gas emissions include construction processes, energy consumption, methane emissions, and refrigerant use. A thorough life cycle assessment must account for both operational and embodied carbon. Operational carbon is the amount of carbon emitted during the operation of a building. This includes both energy and water-related emissions. Embodied carbon is the amount of carbon emitted from the extraction of raw materials for the building to the building's end of life, including refrigerant emissions. It's basically everything that is not covered under operational carbon. Operational emissions largely stem from energy use during the building's functional lifespan. In contrast, embodied emissions cover the greenhouse gases emitted from raw material extraction to manufacturing and transport and installation of the building components. These emissions also extend to the building's maintenance, repair, and eventual decommissioning, including refrigerant leakages throughout its life cycle. We need to start thinking and talking about whole life carbon, not just for the materials that we're using to build our building, but specifically for MEP equipment. Early incorporation of design elements aimed at carbon reduction needs to be a priority. Assessing a building's life cycle emissions during the design phase enables designers to make data-driven decisions that minimize long-term GHG emissions. MEP systems are made largely from high embodied carbon metals. For instance, aluminum for motors, copper for piping, and steel for enclosures and support rails. And due to the low recyclability of these equipment types, virgin metals need to be mined, treated, processed, and transported over long distances, a highly energy intensive endeavor to create new equipment at the end of its short, useful life. So keeping in mind everything that we just discussed, how can we take the knowledge that we have and start the process of moving forward? The answer is by making a system comparison, evaluating each system based on data. So again, in an attempt to create this apples to apples comparison, we're going to assume ventilation is being handled separately for all of the types. And then we're going to look at those things that we just saw in the ASHRAE position document that I believe we can act easily on today. 
So through the next several slides, we'll go through all these topics with uh, VRF, coil, fan coil system, VRF, fan coil system, and radiant heating and cooling. Sorry, my brain is... So I've sort of mentioned this already, um, but you're going to quickly notice that there's a lot of similarities between a VRF design and a fan coil design. The big difference, of course, is the heat transfer medium that's being used. Generally speaking, these systems have a central plant generating hot or cold fluid, hydronic or DX, and distributing that heat transfer medium to zones where the air is then circulated over a coil to be conditioned. Inherent to this design is the need to constantly move air in the space. Unfortunately, that means all the dust, germs, and microbes are also constantly moving in a VRF system or a fan coil system. When air is constantly being moved, it's hard to really clean the surfaces. So this is an adorable picture of a happy child, but it's also a bit gross to think about what all is being inhaled. Now, on the other hand, you might say, well, if the air is constantly being moved, then it's coming back and getting filtered. But let's be honest, filters are not being changed as much as they should be. And ultra high levels of filtration um, come at a premium price point, and they also increase the air side pressure drop and energy required to move the air across the coil. Hydronic radiant systems provide improved air quality by allowing the particles to settle so they can be removed through cleaning of the surfaces. The only air being moved with a hydronic radiant system is the fresh ventilation air, which is being filtered at one single location, and it's much more likely to be monitored and maintained. So with radiant systems, maintenance is really simplified, primarily just requiring visual checks. And whether we want to admit it or not, refrigerant leaks. I know I've personally experienced uh, temperatures in my house feeling warmer than normal. I've made my way to my outside unit and found something that looks like this. And there are a handful of reasons why this could happen, but it is mainly due to refrigerant leaks. It is possible to develop a leak in a hydronic system or a DX system, but a leak in a hydronic system is generally easy to detect. And what the item leaking is water or some mixture of water and refrigerant. I'm sorry, antifreeze. Um, hydronic systems that are well designed have multiple points of isolation as well. Um, so you can really isolate that part of the system to fix the leak. And hydronic systems that distribute heating and cooling energy produced by a refrigerant based source can be designed so that the refrigerant containing devices can be located outside the building or confined to a mechanical room. A VRF system leak is a serious issue due to the large volume of refrigerant that's in the, the piping network. A single leak can result in a complete refrigerant loss and even require building evacuation or intervention from a hazmat team. R14A and similar refrigerants can displace the air in a room. And in spaces with minimal ventilation, it is possible for refrigerant concentrations to reach values that could render occupants unconscious and ultimately lead to suffocation. For this reason, ASHRAE standard 15 limits the refrigerant volume based on the smallest space served. So people who are designing VRF systems should verify the amount of the refrigerant that could possibly leak and the smallest space into which the refrigerant could accumulate are in compliance with this standard. Properly addressing the risk of refrigerant leakage requires extensive design considerations, added costs such as refrigerant detectors, separate systems for smaller spaces, piping rearrangement, etc. At the end of the day, worst case, the refrigerant builds up in a building and leads to asphyxiation. Asphy Can't even get the word out now. Best case, it gets out of the building and does damage to the environment. Based on the minimal amount of air movement and ensuing ability to clean the surfaces, the minimal amount of maintenance required, and the lack of excessive amounts of refrigerants used, hydronic radiant systems check the box as the best option for health and safety, and radiant comes out on top. So now on to occupant comfort, which is generally measured by IEQ, or indoor environmental quality. IEQ is a broader term that encompasses IAQ, which is indoor air quality, and other physical and psychological aspects of the built environment. IEQ plays a key role in the, the design of high-performance green buildings. Starting with sound. 
So with a VRF system or a fan coil system, the space temperature fluctuates. That's really what the system works based off of. So the fan and the motor are constantly on and off. And I'm sure you've all experienced both this nonstop temperature swing and the sound of the fan coming on and off and back on again in your offices and uh, other commercial spaces. We hear it so much we're almost accustomed to it. And the noise from these VRF and fan coil systems is generally in the range of 50 to 70 decibels, which is not a harmful noise level, but it's certainly annoying and distracting. And on to odor. When temperatures start to drop, across North America in the fall, people turn on their heat for the first time and they all experience a very familiar smell. The burning off of all of the dust and other things that I will refrain from mentioning that's accumulated on the coil. Again, when the air is the, in the space is constantly moving, it's hard to truly clean the space. Now, when it comes to thermal human comfort, the standard that our industry uses is ASHRAE standard 55. And if you go through ASHRAE standard 55, you'll see that there are six different factors that impact human comfort. Now as designers, we don't really have much control over clothing or metabolism. So we're left with four factors where we can really make an impact. Air movement, air temperature, indoor relative humidity, and radiant temperature. And most of us understand how air movement can impact comfort, and we all certainly understand how air temperature and humidity can, but what is radiant temperature and how does it differ from air temperature? To understand the concept of radiant temperature, let's consider an example. Take the room that we're in right now. So let's say we're radiantly cooling the floor, but the rest of the surfaces are not controlled. So the walls and the ceiling and the doors would be uncontrolled. If we were to take the area weighted average of the uncontrolled surface temperatures, we would get the average uncontrolled surface temperature. And now if we were to take the area weighted average of the average uncontrolled surface temperature and the controlled surface temperature, in this case the floor, then we would get an approximation for the mean radiant temperature. And that is a term that you all probably are more familiar with, especially if you have gone through ASHRAE standard 55. But let's take it one step further. If you were to take an average of the mean radiant temperature and the space temperature, you would get an approximation for what is called the operative temperature. This is important because when you go through ASHRAE standard 55 and you look at the PMV and the PPD curves, you know that that's the temperature that they're referencing. It's the operative temperature, not the space temperature. That's because the operative temperature is the temperature you actually feel, which can be different from the space temperature. For example, not like today, but let's say it was sunny outside in January in Chicago. It's cold, but if the sun is shining, you don't feel so bad. However, the moment you step into the shade or the sun goes away, you suddenly feel much cooler. The air temperature is exactly the same, but you're not getting that radiant energy from the sun. So you now feel colder. And we can add some numbers to our example. So um, we're controlling, again, the floor in this example. If it's radiantly cooled, let's say we have it set at 66 degrees, but the rest of the surfaces, again, are going to be uncontrolled. Let's say the walls here are 76 degrees, um, the ceiling at 78 degrees, and the window at 80 degrees. So if we take the area weighted average, we can approximate the average uncontrolled surface temperature to be 78 degrees and the mean radiant temperature would be 72 degrees. So with a room temperature of 78 degrees, we would have an operative temperature of 75 degrees. So what does that mean? It means that even though the room temperature is actually 78 degrees, we're gonna feel like it's 75 degrees. When we can operate cooling systems at higher temperatures and heating systems at lower temperatures, we can save energy. And here's a perfect example of just that. So this is the Crystals Mall, which is part of the MGM Grand City Center right on the famous Las Vegas Strip. And while you may know the building, what you may not know is that all open spaces in the mall are radiantly cooled. So several years ago, we took a group of engineers to the mall. Of course, we knew it was radiantly cooled so that they could experience what a radiant cooling system felt like. We stopped in this big open area and we asked them how they felt. They all agreed they felt fine, they were very comfortable, and then we asked what they thought the temperature was. The first one said 72, the next said 75, 
74 and so on. So to summarize, everyone felt comfortable and they thought the temperature was probably around 74 degrees. We then took out a space temperature, um, a space temperature thermometer and it was 79 degrees in the space. So in this case, because the floor is radiantly cooled at about 66 degrees, they all felt like the room was 74 degrees. Think about the energy savings that you can realize when you can set your cooling set point at 79 degrees instead of 75 degrees. Now, you would never do that with a forced air system, especially not in Las Vegas in the summer. But with a radiant system, um, we see set points around 78 to 79 degrees for cooling and 68 degrees for heating. Thermal comfort and the lack of temperature swings is a major benefit of a radiant heating and cooling system. Remember, a large part of our body's heat loss is by radiation to cooler surfaces around us. The cooler these surfaces are, the faster they pull the heat from us and the more uncomfortable we feel. By warming the, inter the interior surfaces of floors, walls, ceilings, windows with radiant heating, um, it reduces the heat loss from our bodies. So the familiar but uncomfortable situation of warm air blanketing the ceiling while cool air pulls out the floor is generally eliminated uh, with the radiant heating and cooling systems. Not only does this improve thermal comfort, it reduces heat transfer through the ceiling and the upper portions of the wall. And the higher the building, the more benefit this becomes. Um, so now we no longer need fans to push the warm air down uh, in radiant, radiant heating and cooling systems. And another great benefit of radiant floor cooling is the ability to deal with high direct solar heat gain. I don't know if anyone's ever had to design a space like this, but you can imagine that if you ran your load calculations and sized your CFM based on the room sensible load, then you would feel like you're in a wind tunnel in this space. Um, but we're able to effectively deal with this high direct solar gain because we have a radiantly cooled floor surface. So what's happening here is that you have shortwave radiation of the sun coming through the fenestration. And when it hits the floor, two things happen. Part of it gets absorbed based on the absorptivity of the floor, and part of it gets reflected back into the space. And then that that's reflected is what heats up the space. <laughs> So if we're actively cooling the floor surface, we can absorb much greater percentage of that energy before it gets reflected into the space. And that's why you see so many radiant floors in areas with a lot of glazing. It can really be the perfect solution to a tricky problem. Now for humidity, you always need to look at the dew point. I've heard many engineers express concern about radiant cooling in a humid climate because People think you can't do it. In fact, you can, because it doesn't matter how humid it is outside. It only matters how humid it is inside. And that's what mechanical engineers do as their job. <laughs> Regardless of whether or not a radiant system is being used, it is the job of the mechanical engineer to, man to manage the indoor relative humidity per ASHRAE standard 55 to that 30 to 60% um, and if that's done effectively, condensation will not be an issue. A radiant hydronic, a hydronic radiant cooling system, however, cannot address um, humidity at all. So the latent load will still need to be handled by the dedicated outdoor air unit. So let's take a look at a standard room at 75 degrees and 50% relative humidity. Now, to find your dew point, you simply draw a vertical line from the bottom of the chart up to the saturation curve at your desired dry bulb setting. Then find your desired relative humidity curve and trace that line. Mark a point where those two intersect and draw a horizontal line from that point to the saturation curve. This is the dew point at your desired dry bulb and relative humidity. So the dew point in this example would be between 55 and 56 degrees. If you push that room temperature up to 78 degrees and 50% relative humidity, then the dew point creeps up to 58 degrees. So what does that mean? It means that any surface in the space that is below 58 degrees is at risk for surface condensation. Therefore, we simply keep the surface temperature above the dew point. 
As long as the system is operating properly, we will never be at risk for condensation. A conservative approach is to control the supply water temperature at or slightly above the dew point. This will guarantee that your slab will never reach dew point. And this leads us to our last <coughs> topic for this section, which is design flexibility. The built environment should be able to change to meet shifting needs, whether social or environmental. Flexible architecture considers how occupants needs may change and requires us to design spaces with those changes in mind. <coughs> Theoretically, this reduces the need for redesign, especially in our MEP systems. As the world changes and our occupant needs change faster than we've ever seen, we really need to have um, this design flexibility in consideration. Architects and designers are challenged to meet and exceed these developing demands. When radiant heating and cooling is used to condition the space, the opportunity to reconfigure the space is really optimized. So for the ranking in this category, due to the fact that both VRF and fan coil system, systems essentially require temperature fluctuations, um, we gave them kind of a half a point because despite that they do maintain temperature pretty well, albeit very inefficiently. Um, and that being said, <coughs> to be fair, both VRF and fan coil um, score a little higher than radiant systems for humidity. While humidity is not an issue for radiant systems when it's designed and operating properly, it cannot dehumidify the air at all. So, um, however, radiant heating and cooling systems are certainly the better option for noise and odor mitigation as well as design flexibility. Now on to energy efficiency, where we're going to focus on the distribution side of the system. Several studies throughout the years, like this one from IAPMO, have shown that the farther the piping distance, the less efficient a refrigerant-based system becomes. Although proponents of VRF systems point out that no circulators are needed to move refrigerant throughout a building, electrical energy still is required just to move refrigerant and liquid, um, refrigerant gas and liquid through the pipes. Energy is supplied as electrical input to the system's compressors. The electrical energy consumption for moving refrigerant through a VRF system per unit of heat or cooling energy delivered is significantly higher than that required for a well-designed hydronic system. And the graph we see here compares the energy required to move the cooling medium through the building. The VRF system uses about 6% per 100 foot of refrigerant line set compared to a hydronic system, which uses only about 0.3% per 100 foot of distribution distance. So as you can see, the more piping that is required, the more difficult it becomes to justify a refrigerant-based system over a hydronic system from an energy consumption standpoint. Furthermore, studies have shown that VRF systems are conservatively measured at 50% below published energy efficiencies. The reason is simple. A real building requires multiple D rates to the rated efficiency based on actual operation. Variables in a real building include outdoor air temperature, length of refrigerant lines, elevation change between the condensing unit and indoor splits, indoor room temperature when cycling, actual airflow, constant versus variable room loads, and multiple other real-world operating differences from prescribed laboratory test points. Even oil migration in the refrigerant charge affects efficiency in reality. When VRF systems are lab tested to find published IEERs, a 12 and a half foot separation between the indoor and outdoor unit is used. In a building, there's likely to be hundreds of feet of copper refrigerant installed, refrigerant lines installed. And as we just saw, for refrigerant, distance is the number one energy hog. So for maximum efficiency, water is really the best option. And this is a study that was done by the Lawrence Berkeley National Labs comparing conventional VAV systems with a radiant system coupled with a dedicated outside air system. And they found that by using radiant systems, depending on the climate zone, they could save anywhere from 17 to 42% over the baseline VAV system. 
And if you look at this graph, you can see that a lot of the savings comes from the fact that we can generally reduce the amount of air that we're moving um, and use water to move those BTUs instead. Essentially, we're replacing fan motor horsepower with pump motor horsepower. And we all know that the heat transfer capacity of water is so much greater than that of air. So we can move those BTUs much more efficiently. And so we've seen radiant systems employed in projects such as the Carl R. Darnell Army Medical Center in Fort Hood, Texas, a lead gold project. The Cleveland Clinic, a lead silver project. The Bangkok Airport in Thailand with over 30% energy savings. And Manitoba Hydro Place, which is lead platinum and was recognized at the time of completion as the most energy efficient office building in North America. NREL's research support facility and the David Brower Center both lead platinum. And while designing a radiant system does not mean you're automatically going to receive a high lead rating, these are examples of when posed with that challenge, the design team chose to incorporate radiant heating and cooling as part of an energy efficiency strategy to achieve the highest level by the USGBC. And nothing demonstrates the versatility of a hydronic system like the ability to integrate green technology. From mild to wild, there's very little that an innovative engineer cannot create. Hydronic systems can effectively utilize various energy sources like geothermal and solar for everything from space heating to cooling, snow melting, and domestic hot water. And here's an example um, of that. So radiant, radiant heating or radiant cooling systems, um, our water temperatures are somewhere between 55 and 58 degrees in most examples, which means maybe you don't need that chiller to produce 42 degree water. In this project, it's an interactive science museum in San Francisco where the engineering team um, on the project designed an in-slab radiant cooling system and based on their loads and the slab configuration, they calculated that they needed around 58 degree water and they pull it right out of the San Francisco Bay um, to get very close to free cooling for nine months out of the year. Thermal energy storage, or TES, is a versatile technology that stores heat and cold for later use, and it's ideal for hydronic systems. It saves energy and costs by producing hot or cold water during off-peak times, a practice known as load shifting. And load shifting involves adjusting energy consumption patterns, to use during low demand periods, which is really great for helping us to maintain a stable energy grid. So in the category of energy efficiency, hydronic based radiant systems are still gonna be a clear winner. Moving on to embodied carbon. When using a refrigerant based design, a metallic piping solution is the only option that's acceptable. But when hydronic based systems are chosen, you have the option of using polymer piping solutions. The US EPA has defined life cycle assessment or LCA as a comprehensive method for measuring environmental impacts associated with a product's life cycle. Studies have shown that when compared to copper, the production of PEX uses 42% less CO2 emissions and PEX has 47% less embodied carbon than copper. Design concepts that incorporate environmentally responsible materials and avoid potential contaminants are the standard that we should be building toward. Additionally, polymer solutions can be up to 80% lighter than copper or steel, and there's a direct relationship between the product and a reduction in transportation costs and emissions. They're also easier, faster, and safe to safer to install the metallic solutions, and because polymers outlive metallic systems with life expectancies of 50 to 100 years, you have reduced the need for replacement. So it's another great benefit for not only the owner of the building, but the environment as well. To make real progress towards a more sustainable construction industry, transparency about the products that we're using is going to be required. Environmental product declarations, or EPDs, use LCA calculations to comprehensively evaluate a product's environmental impact along its entire life cycle. They are official documents that contain comprehensive information about our product's environmental impact. This allows engineers to influence the carbon footprint 
of buildings and projects and select the most sustainable solutions. Along with high embodied carbon material for both the equipment and the piping system needed to be used, VRF systems also have a shorter life expectancy. Hadronic systems have been known to last for 25 years or more. VRF systems are more difficult to install. They have more components. They have heavier transportation costs. So once again, hydronic radiant systems are going to be the winner in this category. But let's wrap up our evaluation with economics, where VRF system designs have unique strengths and benefits for buildings and spaces of particular sizes. Many of the industry claims of cost savings relative to other industry standard system designs are based on antiquated comparisons that do not hold up to careful review. In a study commissioned by Xylem Inc. that evaluated HVAC systems in a number of South Carolina schools, hydronic systems outperformed other systems, including VRF, in terms of lower energy use, cost, life expectancy, um, by as much as 24%. Initial cost of a hydronic system is generally lower and systems offer a much wider range of flexibility for components, operation, maintenance, both in terms of parts and service. In October of this past year, I was fortunate to be able um, to attend ASHRAE's inaugural decarbonization conference for the built environment in Washington, D.C., and participate in a session on radiant heating and cooling. So the next few slides I'll be showing today are from that se session where McPherson Engineering delivered the results of radiant heating and cooling projects they designed. This particular example is real data for a school in uh, Saskatchewan that just opened this fall. McPherson initially recommended radiant heating and cooling. Unfortunately, the school district opted to go with heating only, um, but the numbers are certainly still valid. Ultimately, what got installed was a radiant floor heating system with two large custom VAV air handlers for cooling and ventilation. Construction costs for the building came in at $472 per square foot. So taking a look at the heating side of things first, um, the standard option for what is considered a highly efficient design in this market is baseboard heating solution. So that was priced as the baseline in this example. So as you can see, the baseboard solution was going to require 950 linear feet of baseboard heating and would have an installed cost of $148 per square foot. And the radiant solution would require approximately 22,000 square feet to be heated and cooled, and the installation cost there was expected to be around $4 per square foot. So the one thing to note here is that the radiant solution cost does include additional manifolds and piping for cooling even though that did not ultimately get installed. So had it been only for heating, um, the installed cost would have likely been closer to $3 per square foot. Um, so the numbers you're going to see here are very conservative. So this is what the differences would have looked like had the radiant heating and cooling been installed. Um, that alone is a savings of just over $52,000. And looking at the cooling and ventilation side of things, they did decide to go with forced air. Required two pretty substantial custom air handlers, variable speed supply and return exhaust fans, dual air streams with heat recovery, etc. And again, they were sized to handle both cooling and ventilation needs of the space. Looking at the air handlers a little more, each air handler had a design airflow of just over 13,000 CFM, and approximately 5,200 of that was outside air which means had the customer gone with radiant cooling, the size of the air handler cost would have been reduced. The air handler would have only been accounting for the 5,200 uh, CFM of ventilation. Not only would this have resulted in a smaller capacity fan, smaller capacity coils, they would have also been able to eliminate the return air fan, mixing dampers, and a lot of controls that go along with that. The smaller air handler was priced, and had the customer gone with the radiant cooling system, they would have seen an additional $50,000 on the project here. And again, there were two of these air handlers on this project. So the total savings on the cooling side of things would have been around $100,000. And additional savings not shown on this screen would have come from smaller ductwork. It was estimated that the ductwork could have been about 45% smaller with reduced CFM. 
So while there will always be project specific details that will have to be considered, radiant heating and cooling systems should really not be considered a solution that's going to cost you more money. In fact, in many cases, they can result in cost savings, and that's before you turn the system on. So what we just saw were the mechanical savings. There are also architectural savings as well. The baseboard heaters in this school take up space, just like fan coils or cassettes that might be more commonly used on your projects, and larger ductwork requires lower ceilings. So had the customer gone with the baseboard heating, when you calculate the width and length of the cabinet, it would have resulted in about 950 square feet of floor area. Now, it doesn't seem like a lot of space, but at $472 per square foot, that comes in at almost a half a million dollars. This is floor space that the owner would not have been able to use or space that the architect could have excluded from the building to shrink it down. And here are a few pictures of the facility that really show how they were able to fully use the space with clean finishes and being able to put the shelves right up against the walls. So again, this level of design flexibility really makes an impact on how they're able to use the space today and how their needs may change in the future. And what architect do you know that does not want higher ceilings? Had the radiant cooling solution been deployed, the ceiling space could have shrunk by a foot of depth. So when you're working with developers, that's additional selling features as well. This was for a single story building. So you start adding floors and those numbers really start to add up when you're talking about shrinking the overall height of a building. So everything we've seen so far um, was on the installed cost, but now let's look at some savings on the operational side of these systems. To do that, we're gonna see three data sets on three different schools. All three of these schools have radiant floor heating installed, but two have radiant cooling. And all three schools are considered highly efficient with very similar envelopes, same climate, etc. School number one had similar install um, for the design that we just reviewed, so radiant heating but forced air for cooling and ventilation. School number two had radiant heating and cooling and a dedicated outdoor air unit for ventilation. And school number three had radiant heating and cooling and a dedicated outside air unit as well, but also made use of displacement ventilation, which is a method of providing lower velocity air at slightly, cooler, at slightly higher cooling temperatures. And here we see the kilowatt per square foot for a calendar year, um, the same calendar year for all three facilities. So essentially, same use, same climate, very accurate comparison. The top green line is the school that used the forced air for cooling and ventilation. And then we see the other two schools that use radiant cooling and have pretty significant savings. So just to see that another way, we're looking at about a 27% operational savings uh, with a radiant heating and cooling system when compared to essentially the same building using radiant heating but forced air for the cooling. And this is the natural gas cost per square foot for each of those buildings. Again, all three of these buildings had radiant floor heating but this slide was left in because there were different strategies in place for heat recovery and delivering the air. And the takeaway here is that multiple opportunities for savings exist when you consider the entire system, not just the fuel source. And when you consider that installation labor is the largest cost in a radiant project, being able to significantly increase the efficiency of the installation can help save projects that may be at risk um, during value engineering exercises. So to help lower the cost of a radiant system, radiant rollout mats provide a fast, efficient, and consistent method for installing radiant heating and cooling system that can save up to 60% of the time, reduce wire ties, manifolds, etc. As more and more engineers and building owners come to understand the benefits of high mass radiant heating and cooling systems, we are seeing applications being used in large scale projects like this one, which is just under 3 million square feet of radiant heating and cooling in Cupertino, California. This building integrated over 4,000 precast void slabs with embedded tubing to create a state of the art four story corporate headquarters. And the radiant heating and cooling system here was designed to work in conjunction with a natural ventilation strategy that helped the project earn a LEED Platinum rating.
To achieve our environmental goals, corporate real estate must act now. Decarbonizing our buildings offers cost savings, compliance security, and a competitive edge as more and more consumers become aware of what is going on. Focusing on system efficiency, renewable energy sources, and green materials will help owners avoid future depreciation of their buildings. And choosing a hydronic system is the best option for your building now and in the future. So here in our last category of economics, hydronic radiant systems really excel. Now that we've addressed all five areas that we initially identified in the position document, you can clearly see that hydronics and specifically hydronic radiant systems can truly help you achieve your decarbonization goals. And I want to give you some resources that are available, um, free resources that are available. So how can we mitigate the impact of embodied carbon and operational carbon? It begins with architects taking the lead. Prioritizing design strategies such as optimizing daylighting, window to wall ratios is essential. The goal is to align as closely as possible with a passive design principle um, by upgrading our building envelopes. Adopting a less is more uh, philosophy is key in our mechanical systems. This means of specifying lighter equipment with economies of scale. Studies have even shown that integrating equipment with architectural design, like using the concrete slab as a heat exchanger in a radiant heating and cooling system, um, can reduce whole life carbon emissions by up to 40% when compared to a standard all-electric building. Addressing refrigerant leakage is paramount due to increasing pollution and temperatures driving greater mechanical cooling demand around the globe. It is vital to specify low GWP refrigerants with minimal leakage and make sure that you are having 100% refrigerant capture and recovery at decommissioning um, for your building. Conducting a whole building life cycle assessment early um, in the design phase is also key. And advocate for data transparency by requiring product specific EPDs throughout the design, budgeting, bidding, and procurement. Multiple studies have been done by many independent labs and universities to support the information that was presented in this presentation. Those studies have analyzed buildings across North America in a mix of climate zones from warm, humid 3A to very cold 7A, and they consistently come to similar conclusions. Results suggest strong energy savings potential for radiant systems, even cooling in the majority of climates, like the one referenced here by the Center for the Built Environment at Cal Berkeley, as part of the California Energy Commission EPIC project. This pattern of using radiant systems to accomplish low energy outcomes is also seen by over half of the zero net energy buildings in the new building institutes getting to zero database. And speaking of CBE, we have great free tools such as the thermal comfort tool. This tool has been online and free since 2013 and is being regularly updated with enhancements to include approved changes to ASHRAE standard 55. The Hydronics Industry Alliance is a committee of hydronic equipment manufacturers in North America organized and run by IAPMO, operating under the principle that water is the most efficient and greenest energy transfer medium on the planet. The Alliance serves as a resource within the HVAC and service water heating industry. And the mission of the Alliance is to educate integrate and communicate the advantages of hydronic system solutions. And scanning this QR code will take you directly to the HIAC website where you can learn more on your own. Among the tools provided by the Alliance is BEST or the Building Efficiency System Tool. BEST is a total commercial building tool that models and compares HVAC systems based on actual system performance, data in just minutes, for free, saving time and money while pointing your project team in the right direction for your location, your energy needs, and your budget. BEST incorporates different values to help the project team get started and know what questions need to be asked. 
And the default wizard has the latest data, equipment types, cutting edge calculations. Um, the climactic data comes from ASHRAE, while the 11 typical building types and square footages, as well as fossil fuel costs, are from the US DOE. Equipment costs are provided by a diverse group of manufacturers um, for the industry, by the industry with no ads or gimmicks. Information is updated yearly to stay accurate and can be overridden for your specific project's information from a standard. This slide shows the default four systems, but there are over 30 pre-configured systems including, included, and it's totally customizable. Costs can be compared, and a clear direction can really be provided in minutes. Simply put, water is safer, easier to use, requires less monitoring, and is better for our environment. Water is cheap. It has a high thermal capacity and low viscosity, making it perfect for use in HVAC systems. And radiant systems are the most efficient, most resilient solution for heating and cooling that can be installed today. On behalf of IAPMO and myself, thank you for joining us today, and I'll be around for questions if we have any. Okay, so I'm gonna repeat the question because we're recording. And the question was regarding um, thermal comfort with a radiant cooling system. Um, do we have any feedback that indicates people are concerned with cold feet or an uncomfortability, right? Sure. So in a radiant cooling system, the slab, it, it is regulated. Um, ASHRAE puts a minimum temperature um, out there. So we're not really that cold. Most cooling applications, um, the slab temperature is going to be around 66 degrees. Um, and then, of course, there are a lot of additional factors that are going to impact the heat transfer from the slab to the occupant, like floor coverings and um, even normal footwear, et cetera. But nobody, um, I, don't, I don't think that you could be uncomfortably cold at the temperatures that ASHRAE is going to require you to maintain your slab above. So you can go too cold, but there are standards that are gonna prevent you from doing that. I'm gonna to try to recap your question. Does the hydronic system work in conjunction with the forced air system? Um, is that generally it? Okay. Yeah, so there is usually gonna be some kind of building automation system that's monitoring CO2 levels, outdoor temperature, indoor temperature, and it's always gonna be based on occupancy and the function of the building. Um, but even a dedicated outdoor air system, if it wasn't connected to the hydronic system, would have controls involved with it. So it doesn't have to work in conjunction with it, but it can. Um, they can operate totally independently, and that's the, that's really one of the big benefits is that the radiant system can focus on comfort and the outdoor air system can focus on ventilation because it really just has that one job. You would, you would definitely want to be aware of the types of systems and look at it holistically to make sure that you're not bringing in ventilation air that is so cold that it could cause condensation and I would also like to say that um, we have some people from McPherson Engineering in the audience if anyone has any project-specific questions that they would like to ask. The question is, um, what is the, how do we control comfort level? With a radiant system, you're gonna do that by controlling the slab temperature. With a forced air system, it's gonna be more space temperature. You don't monitor the air temperature at all with the radiant system. You can monitor the air temperature. Um, it depends. It's always going to be a project by project basis, right? It depends on what you have going on. Um, how are you getting your ventilation in? But essentially, we're going to monitor the slab temperature um, 
we we have to be aware of what all is happening though in the space but it doesn't have to be complicated that's that is one thing that people I think shy away from radiant systems because they think it has to be complicated, but you really don't have to overcomplicate the controls. You, you can add a lot of controls, but that just really becomes more expensive and complex. And I think we need more simple things, but these guys do a lot of radiant systems so they can talk to their experience a little bit more maybe.